Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I really hope that you're enjoying Dev Day so far. I want to thank you for joining us here. This will be our panel discussion on building complex apps on Forge. Um, and with me today, we have a really fantastic lineup of partners. They're representing AppFire, Siebert Media, and Adaptivist. Um, I'm going to be your host, Karen White uh, from Atlassian. And let's just start off with a quick round of introductions. Uh, Jeff, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, hi, my name is Jeff Ryan. I am a developer for AppFire. Um, I've been doing software development for a long time, I guess, on a lot of platforms and tech stacks. But for the last two and a half, three years, I've been working in the Atlassian ecosystem. And the last two years specifically working on uh, Forge, bringing one of our server-side apps, our P2 apps, over to cloud and on Forge specifically. Hi there, I'm Julian, a technical coordinator at Siebert Media. And uh, yeah, I have been developing Atlassian apps for eight years now, starting with the server and data center. And uh, a couple of years ago, I moved to cloud. And since its release in 2019, I think, I have been using Forge for developing various apps. So yeah, I'm happy to be here. So what about you, Jill? Hey, I'm Jill, the product manager of Script Runner for Jira Cloud at Adaptivist. Um, I've been involved in the Atlassian ecosystem for more than 12 years now, using the tools, training, and consulting, um, and now as a vendor, having managed both on-prem and cloud apps. And my teams have been dabbling in Forge a bit lately, and I'm happy to share our experiences so far. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here. Uh, let's get right into the discussion. So the first question that I have for you, um, the title of this panel is Patterns for Building Complex Apps on Forge. Um, and so I wanted to dive into a little bit uh, of what that term means to you. So when we're talking about complexity in apps, are we talking about like intricate features? Um, is it a question of scale? Is it a combination of all of those things? So I'd love to kind of hear around the room from each of you on what your interpretation is of that term, uh, complex. So Jill, let's pass it to you first. Sure. Um, so Behaviors, uh, the app that we've made, is unique in that it's a feature of Script Runner and not meant to be its own standalone app necessarily. Um, essentially what Behaviors does is it gives you uh, gives your users a highly customized and dynamic way to interact with their issues at the field level. Um, so what we needed to do was we needed this new Forge app of Behaviors to work with our existing Script Runner app. So we built our own cross-platform identification between Connect and Forge in order to make it work uh, together and give our admins the smooth experience that they expected. Um, we did also require more complex metrics. So we ended up building our own for the level that we needed. And um, also the release process for testing and verifying the app on the marketplace uh, was quite a challenge for us, but with a lot of collaboration and help directly from the Atlassian teams, we were able to pull it off. Yeah, that's really a unique use case and like definitely uh, the definition of complex. Uh, Jeff, I'd love to hear from you next because I'm sure that you ran into uh, you know, a lot of different complexity as you were building JMCF on Forge. Sure, yeah, JMCF. Uh, so if you're not familiar with it, it's a Jira Miscellaneous Custom Fields, but what it is is it's an, introduces additional types of custom fields that you can add to your projects. And the custom fields are a little bit different in that they are essentially functions that calculate the value of the field instead of you just typing in the value. So um, we needed a way to do these calculations when you, add the field to your project over a large number of issues, potentially, you know, thousands or millions, even maybe of issues. And that involves a lot of fetching of data, doing the crunching and the calculating, and then updating all those issues. So there can be uh, multiple fields involved. So they might be running in current, uh, concurrently. Um, 
And then also the fields might depend on one another. So field A might depend on the value of field B, which might depend on the value of field C. So getting the order of those calculations right can be a bit challenging. So those were some, some issues we had to deal with. And then just doing it in a performant way, you know, um, because nobody wants to wait forever for their field values to be <laughs> updated. So trying to figure out how to do that in Forge is a bit of a challenge. And then we also wanted to have a nice uh, set of admin pages. Uh, so we had to find a way to do that in, within Forge. And there's a couple options there that we that we worked on. So those are some of the bigger complexity complex issues, I guess, that we faced. Yeah, having all of that going on in the background and then presenting to your users, this very like snappy, seamless, like simple yeah. experience. And right. complex and it's um, it essentially be transparent to them. Yeah. Um, Julian, uh, let's go to you next. What does complexity mean to you? Um, yeah, in my experience, uh, many apps, uh, at least our apps, start with uh, rather simple use cases and the software becomes more complex when we adapt to customers and their feature requests. And um, yeah, speaking about Forge, it became tricky for us when uh, users were creating a lot of entities, like in our case, a lot of templates, for example, uh, in our app, which were then difficult to query with the given capabilities. Um, also, it is uh, rather challenging to handle concurrent usage of the app as Forge Storage API, which is the persistence layer there, doesn't offer transaction operations. Um, and it gets complex here because we obviously want to prevent data loss and offer a good performance when many things happen uh, like in parallel. Um, I think another rule of thumb would be that uh, apps become complex when they integrate deeply into uh, many UI locations of the host application uh, like Jira. And we recently built a Forge app, which is called Awesome Custom Fields, and it integrates into a lot of views of Jira, like the issue view into multiple locations of the configuration, and now also Jira service management. And this definitely increased the development and testing requirements. We need scripts, scripts to generate uh, testing data. We need end-to-end -end tests to make sure everything works. And um, yeah, we want to make sure that every aspect of those Jira custom fields are covered correctly. So yeah, I would consider this a complex app, I guess. Um, as a general advice, I would say that every app can become complex quickly as it soon it becomes successful and a lot of customers are using it. Yes, very, very true. Um, so the next question that I wanna ask this group and maybe uh, Jill and Jeff, I'll start with you. Um, so I know, as you just talked about, your teams recently released um, for Adaptivist, it was script runner behaviors, and for AppFire, it was Jira miscellaneous custom fields. Uh, both of those apps existed previously for data center and server, and now they're available on cloud. Um, and I'm wondering, as you're thinking about bringing an existing app to cloud, how do you have to kind of change your mindset when it comes to design principles and building, um, especially if you're building with Forge? Um, so Jill and Jeff, I'll uh, ask you maybe Jill first, what does that look like for you? Sure. Um, so we have another team that focuses on the script runner on-prem solution. Uh, so this team worked on the, the the team here that worked on the Forge app. Uh, they were used to working on the cloud environment already, just not so much Forge yet. Um, so what we needed to do was we ran spikes to get familiar and understand how we could build behaviors as close to the on-prem version as possible. Um, but one example of a mindset shift was how the engineers dealt with debugging. So they needed to go to Forge rather than getting alarms through CloudWatch or going to AWS console to look at logs like they would normally do. So we spent a lot of time actually learning uh, to make sure that what we built in behaviors was what we needed to do to make our customers happy. Uh, and uh, Jeff, what about you? Did you right as you <laughs> take a sip of coffee? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, at least I didn't joke on it. <laughs> Um, the biggest challenge for us was moving from this server environment where we had, you know, long running processes, some, some of the things that you could do in server, and now you're running in, in Forge in the Lambda environment, um, you don't have access to those kind of facilities. So no long running process. You have a Lambda that's 
you know, you're limited to basically 25 seconds uh, runtime uh, before you got to give it up. And so um, our big challenge was how are we going to do a job that might take a day uh, to, to do that in 25 seconds at a time? So uh, we end up building a job management system that runs on top of the asynchronous event uh, queue uh, mechanism that Atlassian provides in Forge. And uh, that job manager basically time slices our jobs and, and it works, so, you know, it's when there are calculations in progress, he'll wake up and he'll look and see, well, what calculation is next in the list? And he'll, then says, okay, here you go. And he passes that off and that work gets uh, ran during the Lambda. And then when it's done, the job manager comes back and says, well, if there's more work to do, I'll schedule another uh, event, basically. Uh, it's like a run loop in, in your UI where it'll just keep waking up and checking to see what's the next job to do. And it'll work on it and chunk at a chunk at a chunk at a time. Uh, so that's how we break it up and do our processing. Now there are complications that could happen. So if Jira comes back with a throttle, you get a 429 on one of your calls to maybe update a custom field, then, then basically you're being told to slow down. And that's a little bit complicated when you're in the limited Lambda time. You can't just wait around and call back. So we will use the retry mechanism, which is another facility at Forge added uh, for events. So that when an event happens, if if it either fails for some reason that you think you could re reprocess it later, you can re uh, send a retry response back. And you can also send how long you want to wait before you retry. And so we look at the retry, the retry after headers when we get a busy response from Jira. And then we'll say, okay, well, we don't want to retry until say, two minutes or whatever. And then that event will come in again. And then we'll retry that batch of work. We might scale the work down a little bit so that we don't keep retrying a too big of a chunk that we can get done in a Lambda. So those are uh, ways that we handle the getting that work done in the amount of time. As Julia mentioned, there's complexities as far as the Lambdas being stateless. You can't really have a shared memory system where you're communicating with each other. Um, you can use Forge storage, but it's not concurrent and uh, and there's limits on how fast you can call it. So you can use it and we do, but you have to be judicious about, about that. Uh, the other the other mechanism is you can pass data through the events. So we, we also will do that. Uh, and then we use custom UI for our UI. Um, we looked at UI kit and you can do some nice things with UI kit, but we wanted a little more control over it. So we ended up using custom UI and, and just invokes, which is a pretty nice mechanism too, just a simple RPC call mechanism. But those were how we handle some of those things we were facing. Yeah, Jeff, you clearly picked up a lot of learning on how to work cleverly within Forge as a platform. Uh, and Julian, I know that your business is very cloud focused as well. Um, so what are some of the ways that you think about building on cloud? Mm, yeah, first of all, I'm happy that Jeff has to <laughs> tackle similar challenges like we do. Um, I think from a developer perspective, um, uh, we are lucky that we hadn't had to tackle any larger migration tasks from data center to forge yet. Uh, still, we had to tackle some challenges with our cloud apps. Um, in my experience, there are many differences between the Java environment and data center and uh, the mostly JavaScript or TypeScript based environment in the cloud. Um, yeah, sometimes developers have to get used to the concept of eventual consistency um, because sometimes you need to check the accuracy of data asynchronously in the backend because you cannot access like all necessary data and during the invocation time, which is limited to 20 seconds or 25 seconds, like Jeff said. And um, yeah, and sometimes speaking about the front end, uh, some relatively simple operations need quite a few rest calls in the client. So this definitely increases the need for client caching and a good UI during loading states. Um, yeah, as I'm dealing with some of those UI performance challenges right now, I have uh, two libraries at the top of my mind that I want to recommend here. The first is um, I'm using it right now is React Query. I think it's now called Tenstack Query. Uh, you will find it on Google. Um, it's great for caching responses from the Forge backend and the client, so the you, it feels uh, like faster for the user. And the second library would be React Content Loader, which works quite well when it is about to offer a better loading experience for users, and it uses the skeletons instead of just simple uh, loading spinners. 
Yeah, it's very helpful to hear like specifically those libraries that have helped you. And maybe this question is kind of related. I'm always really interested in kind of like the internal tooling and the processes that software teams use uh, to kind of enhance their development, uh, particularly on Forge. You know, every software company, of course, wants to avoid reinventing the wheel every time they do a new project. So I'd love to hear some examples of things that you're doing to make your development work on Forge more efficient. And uh, yeah, actually, Julian, I'll pass it right back to you. Oh, well, yeah, that is a great question. In fact, it is part of my job to make sure that our development teams can work as efficiently as possible. And, and like you said, a key point when it is about to save time is that you do not reinvent the wheel every time you start a new app or a new feature. Um, yeah, that's why I'm in contact with all of our development teams to make sure that everyone knows the latest tricks about Forge and at Lesson Cloud. And yeah, a key part of our daily development process is that we use a standardized development tooling for all four apps. Um, and we take uh, Turbo Repo as a build system. And this is a library. Um, uh, it's a build system for our repository. So every part of our Forge application, like the client code or the backend functions or some other backends, um, and the manifest YAML and so on, uh, they are separated into build pipelines. This is the term from Turbo Repo. And those build uh, pipelines um, are cached. So if you run a build and there are only changes in your client code, for example, um, the backend uh, doesn't need to be compiled at all. And this saves a lot of time every day. And we also have some other uh, tricks baked in that solve, for example, problems around the uh, missing a multi-app ownership um, of Forge. So many developers know it probably. Only one account can deploy to one app ID. So um, we have a solution for that backed in as well. And there are also like hooks and tricks for uh, continuous deployments. So we can run deployments on Bitbucket Cloud and so on. So yeah, probably the most important aspect of this is that we have open source this whole approach and you can find it for free on GitHub and on CDEX, so the Atlassian developer community. And we publish updates there uh, every week when something changes in Forge that is important. And yeah, I think you will be able to find it when you Google for Forge minus sandbox. Um, yeah, so feel free to, to use it. We would be happy to see your pull requests and hear your feedback. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, we will definitely share that link out with the audience as well. Um, and I know multi-user app ownership is a highly requested feature. Um, Jill, I'd love to hear your perspective next. Yeah, so exactly what you guys were just mentioning, because of the limitations of that uh, single app per developer issue, just like Julian mentioned, um, we wrote a bunch of automations to work around that. Um, since we had a team of engineers working on behaviors, we needed to add our own customizations in order for them to all contribute uh, and work together effectively. Um, and knowledge sharing was really important. So much of what Forge does is explained at a high level. So the most valuable things that we did were we just dove in and experimented and then documented um, everything that we discovered there. Or we'd ask our Atlassian friends direct questions and then documented their answers. So it was really helpful. Awesome. I will say, Stay tuned. We are <laughs> hoping to have multi-user app ownership shift soon. I know we're talking about that elsewhere in this webinar. Um, but one thing that I love is that knowledge sharing is something that's come up in this conversation because that's kind of really why all of us are here today. Um, and yeah, Jeff would love to hear what you have to say on this as well. Yeah, as far as the knowledge sharing goes, I. I one of the great resources for me coming onto Forge was CDEC, the, the uh, developer community. I just, there's so many helpful people out there and, and Marketplace Clarity Slack channel as well. Like, I'm very happy to work in that community because people, they reach out and help each other. You know, they're not necessarily directly co working, but it's, it's a great environment. So if you have questions, a good spot to go to ask or, or help people. So. Uh, other than that, um, yeah, we've faced some of the same issues with the multi-app, you know, development situation. We kind of, at first, it seemed like a bit of a hang-up, but um, really it was 
not too bad. We each have our own app ID, each, each developer on the team. And that works okay because we each have our own developer instance that we're deploying to. Um, and then when we then when we merge in our Bitbucket pipelines, we'll swap into our more official app ID and then publish on a, whenever we have a PR that merges to master, we'll publish it to a broader audience, you know, our, our QA teams and our uh, product management teams and uh, other interested parties. So that process, you know, it just was a little bit of getting used to it, but it, it works pretty well for us. Um, I'm sure the multi-user uh, experience will, will change our process a little bit. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I guess one of the things I like about that process, especially like the tools that we use, the Chrome, or not the Chrome, the uh, developer console, the ability to look at the logs of any of those systems is actually quite nice. You know, when we have our QA teams, looking at maybe reporting some problems, I can just go to that console and pull up the logs and, and see if I, I can even time track, you know, look in this time range and, and see what I was getting, you know, what, what was this error? So that those, the developer console is pretty useful for that and being able to just go to any of the instances that has the install and, and check that out. Um, we also make pretty good use of the tunnel. That's a good tool to use. If you can, sometimes the tunnel tunnel's a bit limited how much traffic it can handle, so you might have to restart it. Uh, but if you can use a tunnel, it's great because you get a, a REPL environment where you know it's running, you can make the change code, you can change your code and it's a hot reload. And uh, it's a pretty dynamic environment, so that works good. Other tools we use like the Chrome development tool set is really nice for custom UI. I, I'm not sure about UI kit. We haven't really worked in that realm, but for custom UI, it's great for server source code level debugging. Um, you can even do some server side debugging using that tool. You can do remote debug into your into your um, you know UI invoke handlers so that that can be helpful. And, and also um, using the network tab in that tool set, you can monitor the GraphQL call. So all the invoke calls are done as GraphQL. So if you go to the network tab and search for GraphQL, you'll see all the invokes from the client, from the front end of the back end, and you can see the payload and the response. So those tools are all quite helpful for us in our everyday processing. Yeah, some great kind of like rapid fire tips there. Um, well, great. So moving on, I know all of you have been early adopters of Forge. Um, and Julian, I hope that you don't mind if I single you out, but I believe that you were actually the first marketplace partner to publish a Forge app on the marketplace, which I think is very cool. Um, and so, of course, since then, you've seen a lot of change in Forge over the last couple of years. And I'd be curious to know how each of you have seen the platform evolve um and yeah julian let's start with you uh yeah sure in fact i started developing a templating.app uh, shortly after forge was announced i think at atlas camp in vienna in 2019 and uh yeah during the last few years several atlas development teams reached out to me to hear my feedback about this experience and uh, it, i always found it super helpful to get an idea of how atlas's plans uh, are to involve the platform and yeah, back then I started templating app, um, which is an app that allowed you to manage issue templates and so on. Um, we started this app because we had to find a use case that is already possible to implement with Forge with a given APIs back then. And yeah, with every coming Forge release, uh, we tried to figure out new ways to improve the app according to these new capabilities uh, until today. And yeah, nowadays, um, speaking about Forge, uh, much more complex apps can be built on top of Forge. Um, there are even use cases uh, nowadays that cannot be implemented without Forge, <laughs> um, like the one um, the one of our app, Awesome Custom Fields, I talked about earlier. And I think it uh, should be the same for Adapterwist's uh, Behaviors app. Yeah, that's a great segue. Um, I'd really love to hear your perspective on that one. Yeah, um, we do see Forge becoming more capable. And every time we consider putting new features into our products, um, it's always it's always uh, something we are considering. Um, there are more things that probably need, uh, that are needed to get to the level required for productively building apps at the scale of ScriptRunner. Um, and a feature like behaviors, but 
um, like the issues that I mentioned before with the metrics and developer experience, but um, we sincerely appreciate all the help that we've gotten from the Atlassian teams. They've been so helpful um, being transparent with their roadmaps and strategies. So we're keeping an eye on all of that. And yeah, it's just been a really great help. Yeah, definitely having the collaboration and the feedback from our partners is really essential for building a platform like Forge. And Jeff, I know that you've also been really involved with working closely with the Atlassian team. Yeah, we've had a lot of dialogue with Atlassian over the last couple of years. I mean, this project, we, it was a bit different with GMCF because we we had this complex app already and we had, were trying to find out, okay, how do we do this in the, in, in Forge environment? And at Jillian and but Jill and Julian have said, you know, there were just features that weren't there yet. Uh, the, uh, the ability for an app to introduce new custom field types it didn't even exist at the beginning. So that was probably the first gateway, you know, that we had to pass. Um, and then uh, once that happened, then okay, so now we can create these types. We needed more things unblocked, like how do we going to run this long job? So the async job queue mechanism was also a fundamental new piece of technology that enabled that. And uh, and then you know we wanted to make sure it was done with high quality, and we needed that that retry mechanism. Really, when that came about, was another big win for us. So the, these incremental they seem incremental, but they all add up to uh, enabling a lot more complex applications. Um, and I'm sure that's not done. They're not done. We've also had a lot of increases in quotas and limits, which also lets us do more in a more performant way. And, and I know that there's more coming. So it's been a real good collaboration. Uh, you know, when we ran into issues, we were able to pretty quickly get a hold of somebody and get some help and give feedback, frankly. So it was a good bi-directional connection. Right. Thank you all so much, both for your partnership, um, really helping to push the boundaries of what's capable on Forge, and also for being here today and having this conversation and sharing all of your knowledge with the rest of the community. Uh, for everyone who is out there watching today, you can find all of our panelists in Slack. So hit them up, let them know what you enjoyed about this session, ask them questions. Um, and if this is a topic that you're particularly interested in, uh, be sure to sign up for tomorrow's workshop on working with large data sets in Forge. It's a really great way to kind of get hands on with some of the topics that we covered here today. Um, and yeah, be sure to stick around for the next two sessions. We have some really great talks coming up on data residency and compliance. So thank you so much for watching and take care. Okay.